It looks like it's 6 30, mm -hmm. so it's time to start the meeting. So at this point in time, let's see if I do this. I did. Okay. All right. Open okay, the meeting. Uh, we'll start with flag salute. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the government for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Well, for those in the video world, my name is Neil Turner. I'm the vice chair of the Rochester School Board. And at this point in time, we're going to start with our roll call. Susie? Here. Grant? Here. Michael? Present. I'm Neil. I'm present. And Thomas has been excused tonight. And with that, um, do we have any public comment at this time, Justin? Nobody's in the room currently. And... There is no public comment. No public comment to start our meeting. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, next thing up is going to be our consent agenda. You will have a motion to approve. So moved. All right. We're at first. And do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. All right. On to our next part. We are going to go into reports tonight. And we have our student representative, Grace, here tonight. Thank you. We're having prom May 4th up at Olympia Ballroom. Our Latinos Unidos Club will be hosting a multicultural festival on April 26th up at the Rochester High School. Our sports med went to state for the first time this month. FBLA went to state today. Theater will be performing the out-of-towners with the RHS band on May 17th and 18th at 7 p.m. And our jazz music festival is at April 27th. That's as far as I know it. Thank you. So April 27th, uh, that's going to be where? Um, middle school. At the middle school? Mm -hmm. Jazz? Cool. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Grace. Thank Anybody you. else have any questions for Grace? Thank you. All right. Next, we have our special education report. It's me. Yep. Presented by Laura. I just sit down and talk, or you know, do I want me to stand up? Come on. You're so <laughs> you can do whatever you want. I will let you. I'm going to stand here and look super official. So, uh, good evening. My name is um, Mrs. Staley, and I'm here today to talk to you about special education. How do I do looking official? Very good. good. Thank you. Okay, so I want to talk to you tonight just about some of the things that are happening in in, in special ed. Uh, we are seeing an increase in numbers and an increase in needs and programs. So I'm just going to share a little bit of um, that information with you. Um, I'm going to. I want to start with early learning. Early learning is our transitional kindergarten, which we've had for the last three years. That's for students that are have turned four by August 31st um, and are under five by August 31st. So it's that four-year-old range. Um, and the other class we have is our early intervention program, which is our, uh, our program for students with IEPs. That early intervention program does not have students without IEPs um, at this time. Someday I would like it to. But TK has been a great step in that direction because TK has... Um, about a third of the students have IEPs. This year, it's a little bit less, um, which was kind of a interesting dynamic in numbers because the next group coming up, there are a lot more. But this year we have, um, can you skip to the next slide, please? Uh, this year we have nine students with IEPs in our transitional kindergarten. So we have two classes of 18. Typically we have about six in each class. This year we have um, about six in one class and three in the other class. Our numbers are a little lower. But that's our opportunity for our four-year-olds to get to get to be with their general ed peers and be more prepared for kindergarten. Um, the our really unique situation is REIP, which is our early Rochester Early Intervention Program. Historically, that's been our three and four-year-olds, but with TK, the majority of the four-year-olds are in TK. Um, typically, we've had. I'm going to show you a little more statistic around this. But typically, we've had considerably less students than what you're seeing here. Right now, we have 33 students 
Um, and that's in, we have a morning class of four mornings and an afternoon class, four afternoons. And so right now, three of them are served in other locations, one in a preschool in Tonino, one um, uh, here, the other two in town at different preschools, but 30 of them are in the class. So that means the morning class has 18 and the afternoon class has 12. So we're talking 18, like just turned three in the class. It is the sweetest, most fun, <laughs> busiest class you will ever see. Um, so you can keep going, please. So this gives you a little bit of um, the history in early learning. Um, the first three you have, I'm sorry, am I in your way? No, oh, you can look over there. The first three, you'll see the numbers are the same because overall, our RERP were all of our early learning students. So 18, 19, 19, 20, and 2021, 20, um, you can see the number of students in our IP was, it was everybody. So 26 down to 21, down to 19. And then the next year, you'll see that blue line is our overall number is just jumping up. Um, you'll, the yellow line that year, 21, 22, we had one TK class, so only six students in there, and then it's gone up. And that one on the far right is where we're projected to start next school year. So we already have um, 11 out of 12 of our students with IEPs that will be in TK already pretty much set, not 100%, I'd say about 80%. We have 11 of them set because there's a process to go through to make sure that they are appropriately placed in TK. And then outside of that, uh, we're gonna, we have probably about 35 in uh, the early, Rochester Early Intervention Program. So we've only had one teacher the last couple of years since we started TK. Um, this year, she's been an amazing trooper having 30 kids in her program, but next year we're gonna split it up into two teachers. And when you look at one of the things that occurs in TK um, in early learning, I apologize, is kids come in all the time because as kids are qualifying for special education, they start in program, like whenever they qualify, they start right away. And when you have our, our littles, you might have families who find out from their pediatrician or just themselves are feeling like, you know what, my kiddo needs some extra support. So we may have students come in and start looking at, oh, oh look at that, I'm a slide ahead. <laughs> so you might have medical professionals say, hey, you wanna might look into special education or other preschools, like we've had referrals from Head Start or um, other preschools in the area that says, hey, this, this child might need some extra support. So that's one of the ways we have kids come in pretty regularly in that way. Um, we also have students that are in uh, birth the three program, which is called part C of special education. And that's served in our region by parent to parent. There was a while that we as a school district served the birth to three, uh, 17, 18, 19, around in that time. Um, and then it moved to parent to parent. But when students are in parent to parent, they have what's called an IFSP, um, individual aid this family service plan. And then those students um, are evaluated to determine whether or not they qualify for part B or three-year-old to 21 special education. So we have many students that are in the birth to three program. And if they come to us, we have a very tight timeline. They need to be evaluated and in program by the time they third, turn three by their birthday, they need to be able to walk in the door. So, because of that, would you mind going back a slide, please? Um, at that bottom, that bottom sentence there, we typically add 30 to 50% more students during the year. So preschool is really different than other grades. I mean, kindergarten, you kind of start the year that way. Most grades, you know who's coming. Preschool, we have no idea. So we, so this change from going to about 20-ish kids to almost 50 kids has been a really significant change for us. And so trying to figure out, is this trend going to continue? Is it not going to continue? You know, we haven't knocked on people's doors and said, hey, are you going to have more babies soon? You know, you, I mean, you don't know because we're looking at the really littles. Yeah. So trying to figure that out. Um, but I really need to say for our preschool team, they've worked incredibly hard. <laughs> Their numbers are high and they continue to serve these kiddos in incredible ways. Um, a little bit later, I'm going to talk about 
the services for preschool kiddos, but we'll just keep going for now. I just took a couple pictures of the preschool. Question. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want questions now? You want to wait? Till I was just going to do show this slide, and then I was going to ask questions about preschool. But go ahead and ask your question because it's just cute kids. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> cute kids. Um, no, I might have forgotten. It. Oh, you're adding a teacher. So does that mean there's going to be like two classes in the morning and two in the afternoon? Or yes. Is that what you're yes, okay. that's what it'll be. And I'm not going to go deep into funding. Jill can save me if I um, say something wrong. But preschool special education funding is different than for students age 5 to 21. So preschool special education funding can, is more likely to financially sustain itself versus five-year-old to 21. So when we're looking at a, adding a second teacher, Jill and I have talked about it. And of course, you know, I have asked Jill is what the conversation is. Jill, can we do this um, with this number of students? And so we should have, getting a second teacher should be sustained by the number of students we'll have. Now, the hard part of that is we have, I think it's 12 mm -hmm. students that are like in process of being evaluated between now and September. We don't know if those 12 are going to qualify or they're not going to qualify or what's going to happen. So it's, you're there, you're a little bit trying to play the odds with it, but we have enough right now that we will be able to sustain two teachers and maybe trying to figure out what to do maybe or next year when we have more. So these are some students in the preschool class. I want to um, draw your attention, even though the kiddos on both sides are quite adorable. The picture in the middle is um, one of the things that you will see at every desk in our preschool class. All visuals for students. Um, you see a little schedule there. The preschool, if you have not visited it, visited it is pretty amazing the way it is set up for each student to be successful with all of the accommodations and modifications they need in that room. And any other questions about preschool? TK. Question, are, how are the kids transported? Do, do they do individual parents or do we have bus service? Today? We do have bus service, yeah. They, they all ride a small bus and then and the bus uh, goes into the back of the primary school. The preschools are in portables in the back. And so the bus goes right there and they can walk out and walk right up into the ramp into the into the preschool classroom. Yeah, yes. Okay, so one of the things I, I wanted to bring this up just briefly, special education numbers over time, because um, the legislature the last couple of years has bumped up the percentage of students with IEPs that we will get funding for. So it used to be 13.7%. So we would only get dollars per student up to 13.7% of our total population, regardless of how many students with IEPs we have. Then it went up to um, 15, what is it now? 15.2, yeah, 15.2. Now it's up to 15.2. Which did help us a little bit, um, and then next year it's going to go up to over 16. We are not there, so that change won't help us much. Um, we want to be really purposeful in who we qualify for special education. So that particular change from the legislature will help some districts. It won't really help us. I'm still thrilled for the districts that will help. I think it's great, but I just wanted you to be aware because you may have seen that change that we have stayed fairly st steady in that 15 to 16 range. 21, 22 was a little low. That was kind of the COVID time. It was, you know, everything was a little unique number wise there. The rest of it stayed pretty steady. Any questions on that? Nope. Okay, this is, this is where I wanted to talk a little bit about the change in what we're seeing with our students in the preschool. So I would say um, over time, um, when we typically had students in the preschool who are maybe nonverbal or who are struggling with, you know, they, they don't know shapes or colors or things like that. And we're getting more and more kiddos in our preschool who are not able to physically do things, um, maybe physically, you know, get an on, on and off the bus or 
walk around by themselves. We have little little kiddos that have these cute little walkers um, and we have kiddos that use strollers and all kinds of different things. We have students whose physical fine motor types of skills are really delayed. Um, and we have a lot of students who across the district who have speech and language um, disabilities. And a lot of theory about is that COVID related? You know, when you think about like these three and four year olds, early on in their lives, they weren't seeing mal movement on the adults around them. There are lots of theories. Regardless, we're at, at a huge increase in all three of these areas. Our communication, occupational therapy, and physical therapy, uh, our percentages are way up. Typical years for communication, students who qualify for speech and language, 150, 155 kids. This year, we're at 178. Um, occupational therapist, typically 50-55, um, and we have one full-time occupational therapist. Um, currently, we're at 70. And physical therapist, typically 15-20, we're at 28. So if you see, we have some pretty large increases that have been over the last year and a half. Are you still in the preschool or this is all great? This is the whole district increase, but a good portion of it is in the preschool. So um, I would say like physical therapist therapy, we probably have typically a couple kids that qualify in preschool. And now we're, I think we have like 10 that qualify in the preschool. So just big jumps. Okay, any questions on that? Yeah, one question. So what about the little guys that are just, um, do not speak in English at all? So where do they go? So if we have students, we do have students in the preschool that are, um, um, multi-language learners. Um, we are really careful when we evaluate them for special education to make sure it's not a language barrier, that it's a disability. So we do some testing. At that age, they're not reading anyway, but we do some testing to determine their skills. Um, so at the <clears throat> three-year-old level, if they qualify with a disability, we'd still serve them in a preschool. But at the four-year-old level, they can oftentimes be in uh, transitional kindergarten. And that's one of one of our screen screeners for transitional kindergarten. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So I'm going to keep going. Now we're in total just overall special education out of preschool, but I just wanted to talk through um, a few things. You may have seen uh, you. Some of you have seen similar data to what you're seeing here before, but I think it's always important to keep in mind. As a state, um, Inclusionary Practice Project is getting a higher percentage of our students in a general education setting. And so when people think of special ed, the question comes up, are students in a self-contained classroom? And the answer is typically no. So what we do is we look at the least restrictive environment for a student, and really we're looking at having students in general ed to the maximum extent possible. That's the, what the WAC says. Um, and so thinking about how we can help students to be successful in general ed with the supports that they need. So this just shows overall in our district, um, age, uh, grades K through 12, where students are falling. So you'll see this here, um, about 62% of our students are in the general ed class 80 to 100% of the time. About 30% are in gen ed about half the time and about 6% are in gen ed less than 40% of the time. So one of the things you'll see is we've worked hard over time to change that level three. So we have more students in gen ed more of the time, change that level two, same reason, more students in gen ed more of the time. One of the things we're finding this year, which relates to something I talked about way back with the CARO training, is we have more students who have more significant behavior types of needs who need more time and more of a self-contained setting. So that's been that's that's been why you see that number going up a little bit that to six percent. Okay, and this is per building. Same information, just broken down per building. Primary school, that is where the um, most significant behavior concerns are occurring. We're having students who are struggling to regulate. So you see that level three is higher, but also kudos to the primary school because 75, 76% of the students are in gen ed most of the time. 
And this is 76% of students with IEPs. For the high school, um, Jennifer and I were talking about this earlier, if they're in special ed for more than one class, they move to that middle section. So when you're talking periods, you know, then it, it changes quickly. So that LRE changes. Any questions on that? Okay. Yeah. All right, so just thinking about what we have as a district, um, and this is these are the types of things because special ed is um, not a cheap part of our, our district budget. Um, we go into the red every year, and I want you to be able to to understand the why of it a little bit, and to know what's happening in the world of special education. And and so that's I just think it's important for you to have to to see this and just to know what we're doing. Um, so when we think about the continuum of programs for students in our district, um, we have students that are in what's called life skills in some buildings, learning center in another in other buildings, where they spend some time in, in that self-contained setting. Sometimes it's just to help them regulate. Sometimes it's to because that's really what they need for their academics. Um, the primary school and the middle school have some specific classes around behavior support. Um, all of the classes have resource, which is, uh, or all of the buildings have resource, which is like, I'm going to go in and get my reading support in a special ed setting. Primary and elementary, almost all of the students get it in general ed as well. Middle school, high school, some of them do, some of them only get in the resource setting. Any questions on that? Okay, I'm going to go way sw switch gears here a little bit. So um, this is something that I've tried to share with you for the last number of years. Should have started with the high school because the middle school data is better. We should have um, started with the data that's not as good. But um, something to think about is our students in a, with IEPs, are they participating in sports and activities in the district? So the middle school, I didn't put this percentage down, but uh, I think it's, 15 or 16% of the students in the middle school have IEPs. And so you can look at this, about almost half of the students with IEPs are in activities or sports. Uh, in sports, uh, almost 10% of the students in sports have IEPs, but 16% of the population is has an IEP, so we're not there yet. Um, with activities, slightly higher, we're not there yet, but we're continuing to try we're continuing to try and hand out the flyers. These are all the things you can participate in. We want you to participate, um, but the numbers are growing slightly. And high school, um, sports is a low number. Uh, last year, for those of you that were here last year, you had asked me like to kind of break it down because initially, there were 77 students or 28 students in sports. Well, that could be, you know, we wanted to make sure, well, what if it's, um, you know, Grant Roadhaver's in like six sports. And so is, does he count as six students as one for one student? So that's why I wanted to make sure to break that down. So you could see what that's in sports, 22% of students with IEPs are in sports. So you can see that it wasn't just four grants. There were, you know, different students as well. Um, activities. Activities are part, a lot of activities are um, during the school day. They have, um, how often, can you tell me, how often is your um, club day? Club day, it's every other Thursday. Every other Thursday. So because of that, all students with IEPs are participating in some type of club. So we can celebrate that part because the high school is about 12.8% special ed. So. I'll let's say that again. 12.8% special ed at the high school. Yeah, that's all. Yep. On the sports, if they're not able to play the sport, but they're a manager, for example, or something like that, do they count as being part of the sports or yes. activities? Yep. Yep. So, and that's, I can think of a, one particular example of a student that that happened with. Um, and he is, very excited to be a part of the team and we'll go into class and talk about his participation and it's really it's a good thing for him because 
Um, he didn't make the team, but he's still a part of that community. So. Okay, and last is there's just a picture from a couple of the buildings of some of our students and uh, learning in different ways that happen. Okay, the one in the middle, they're in line to leave the room, but I got there too late. So um, <laughs> I could pretend they're talking with each other as part of a learning activity, but they're getting there in line. <laughs> so so uh, that's all I have. Um, I just wanted to give you an overview of what's happening in the world of special education. Uh, as always, it's I'm very passionate about the work and I love to talk about it all the time. So don't hesitate if you ever have questions or if you ever have ideas or anything that can help us do the best for our kids. So, yeah. One more. Um, we've spoken over the years about, I think it's integrated sports or where you've got the mixture. Is that oh gosh. something that... Uh, <laughs> I should have talked about that today. <laughs> yes. Are we working on it? Yes. Oh. So at the primary school, uh, Nicole Crennan, who is our new assistant principal, has started uh, integrated support, uh, sports. Um, do you want to speak there for a second? Are you part of that? Are you are you out there during that time? I've seen it, yes. Okay. <laughs> so they have started some sports activities um, with Unified Sports. So Unified Sports is helping provide some uh, materials. They've done soccer and some different things like that. And so students with IEPs and other students are participating during recess in this um, integrated sports. We're starting at the primary school because this was kind of a passion area for Nicole. And then she ended up at the primary school. So she started it there. And we have our transition kiddos from the high school that come down and help on Mondays with that. And so the kiddos, we have kiddos in general ed, kiddos in special ed all out there together. We have students participating that don't typically participate with others in, at recess. And so um, Nicole has shared this out with Ad Council and I have every expectation that we'll be, we'll be moving to other buildings next year because the other principals are, and building administrators were like, can we do that? So uh, yes. That's awesome, that's great. I should have talked about that tonight. Thank you, Michael, for asking. And it's, that is Nicole Curran. She, she has done an amazing job with it. I can't take credit for anything other than saying, hey, we thought about doing this and she just ran with it. Any questions? Any other questions, board members? Well, I got one. Okay. Um, you said that uh, the cost, it, it brings the district into the red. We lose money with having a special ed. How is that broken down as far as funding? Because I know a lot of the uh, requirements special ed are federal. And then we also have, you said we received some money from the state. I know it's been a position that the schools have been like, hey, we need more funding for special ed and for buses, transportation, things that are not being funded fully. And uh, I think the state has a responsibility to make sure they are. But how does that break down? Um, do, do you know? So like how much we're using outside of special education mm -hmm. or well our local tax levy dollars are being spent on things that should be federally and state funded well and federal funding we get a small side set slice mm -hmm. the majority of our funding is state funding but we're 1.5 to 1.5 to 2 million over budget depends on who shows up tomorrow yeah so, <laughs> what we have to provide to them yeah so we're typically around that range you know 1.5 to 2 million over working really hard to keep it, sounds terrible, but it, we're working really hard to not be more over budget than that, you know, but, um, and when we see, like Jill says, depends on who shows up to the increase in needs with occupational therapy and speech therapy and those kinds of things, um, that becomes more people. And so trying to navigate how all of that works while providing good programs for all of our students, because that's, Critical. We we need to do that. Um, but here's my advocacy for funding is you know moving the percentage up is great, but the cost multiplier. You know how much we're getting per student needs to go up because the complexity of the needs of our students. Having a student who struggles with reading, kind of thing of the past. And I can say when I started ten years ago, 
there were lots of groups of, you know, reading groups or math groups, and now the needs are so much more complex almost across the board. We're sending a lot more students out of district. Yeah, more students out of district. Um, okay. We have more kids that need one on ones. We have more kids who are in our seventeen programs, yes. which are more costly, which is where the cost multiplier will help. Yeah. And then with the expectations of these the younger kiddos that are coming in in, in pre K right now, expectations they're going to be filling seats in school too. Yes, with some very significant needs. Yeah. Do you attribute a lot of this to um, uh, the COVID? The lockdown stuff that we went through, the behavioral issues that we're seeing at the uh, elementary school. I, I have a lot of theories. You know, I don't know what what the real answer is. Um, I will. I do think that that has definitely impacted the students' speech because of having the masks and um, not being able to communicate. The rest of it, I have a lot of theories, but I, I don't. I don't have the answer. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. We really appreciate thank all you. the work you're doing. And it's important, you know, the learning loss, we're trying to get it addressed. And, and uh, thank you. Yeah. And I just uh, thank you to the staff that works really hard with kiddos who have some complex needs and they care about them and they do the best. Thing. So thank you. Thank you. All right. And next, we are resources. <laughs> I'm going to start sneaking pictures of cute kids and besides their eyes, exactly. Um, so our April FTE was 2013. Um, so we're still trending about 55 kids over budget. Running start, we had 38 students, so we're running start only and 89 total participants. Um, HARP moved up to 45 students. Our SPED count increased to 345, and there were eight kids eligible, eligible to be counted for the dropout reengagement program. Um, the next one's just a visual of a trend, um, just more evidence of it's hard to to guess what's coming the next year when this is what you're looking at and nothing's the same from year to year. Um, so we're still really using a crystal ball to determine enrollment. Um, at the end of March, the fiscal year is 58.33% of the year complete. Our revenues were at 53.12, which is normal. We'll catch up in April when we get our next levy payment and our expenditures are right at 58.32. People are staying within their budget. Um, the next one is the often summary. And this one shows the transfer that was approved out of capital projects into general fund. Um, you'll see that in March, we did have $4,672, but that would not have been enough for Jody to pay accounts payable come April 5th. Um, so that's why the loan was needed. Uh, we should be able to pay the loan back about um may 7th the treasurer will tell us uh the interest and we'll be able to transfer it back out so it was just a short-term loan is that from the state office no nope, it's from us so we actually borrowed from our own capital projects fund and gave it to our general fund, and That's then we'll be able to just give it back so it's all still rochester school district money um we just have to pay ourselves interest Any questions? Yes. All of them tonight. Um, seniors, that number looks much lower than what we've had recently. Under 100? Am I reading that right? I can see where. Huh? Um, but that number does not include our full time running search. Oh, okay. so that'll be more. Um, because right. yep, we don't get to count any FTE for them. Oh. So, of the, th I mean, there are 38 that are running start only. Um, and that headcount on the far right is 126. I will tell you that number includes uh, heart on this report. Um, so the high school will be expected to be right around 100. Still smaller it's than, small. yeah, it's a smaller yeah. class. Yeah. And then heart got to be best at the seams at the 
Yes, and uh, another thing that's in her, if somebody can remind me the name of it, a new program that we have, the Red Red Alliance. Dropout. What? Red Alliance. Red Alliance, it was approved um, early in the fall. Those kids are counted in heart numbers as well, but I believe it's a smaller number three. in Red Alliance. Three. Yep, so that is still a higher number for heart. A larger number for heart. It's been a long day. <laughs> Any other questions, board members? All right. Thank you, Jill. Another good stuff. At this point in time, it is our super report. All right. So, just a few things to share tonight. Uh, last time we met on April 10th was the same day as our kindergarten information fair, and there was a Fabulous turnout at the fair, um, higher turnout than many of the previous years. There was 70 families, at least 70 families that were there. The kids were able to walk around, do a scavenger hunt with their families. They went to many different rooms. They had the opportunity to talk with different teachers, different staff, a uh, counselor, our uh, behavior analyst was there. Um, the kids were given activities that they could do at home to help them prepare for kindergarten. They were able to walk into the bathrooms and learn how to use a, the bathroom in the school and wash their hands. Um, it just, it was a wonderful experience for the kids. And the really nice thing is that, you know, we're starting to build that preparedness for kindergarten. The kids were getting comfortable in their building. Afterwards, there was a dual language information night. So the families who were interested in that program were able to stay and learn a little bit more about that. And um, they, one of our teachers actually taught a lesson in Spanish and the kids were able to participate in that. So a good night for our, for our soon to be kindergartners. Next, we have, we've got a lot of schools that are really getting parents and families back in our buildings. That's a big focus this year. And this is a VIP breakfast that took place at, at GMES. They, they had the breakfast prior to school starting. I think they they sat down for breakfast at about 20 to 9. And um, the kids were able to invite whoever they thought deserved to come to them to breakfast with them for the wow. VIP breakfast. We had some kids that invited their brother. We had others that invited grandparents and neighbors and parents and um you know, is who, who, the, who was important to these kids? And we had 150 students who had somebody that they brought in and had breakfast with at the VIP breakfast. So good, act, good activity and a great way to have our family and community come in. Um, once again, on Earth Day, on Monday, they all of our K-5 students took a tree home thanks to, thanks to Meister's uh, Family Tree Farms. Um, over a thousand students or a thousand trees were shared with our kids. This is the third year of the event, and you can see a lot of happy faces there. We had pictures from the primary school, but the kids were very excited to, to get their tree, and hopefully they've taken them home and put them in the ground because they're going to get some rain in the next few days. So it'd be a good time to put them in there and let them grow. It was also bus driver appreciation uh, day on Monday. The week is blending together Monday. Yeah. So uh, we made sure our bus drivers were thanked, um, especially thanks to Candace Robinson, who went out and put together a, a big uh, celebration for our bus drivers. But we do have 33 bus drivers this year. We have 30 routes that they're covering. Our most senior driver this year is Gail Allen. She's been driving for 38 years. Mm -hmm. And our newest driver, Sean Wilcox, just began on April 17, 2024. But they're a big part of our team. Getting our kids to school every day is really important. I watched a bus driver today. Um, we had two kids running down the street. The bus, they obviously had missed their bus. And, you know, the bus driver took the time to tell them how to cross the street safely so they could get to them and get back on the bus. So they, they really work hard to get our kids to school safe every day. And it's a tough job. I don't know that I'd want to be a bus driver. And I'm so thankful that we have people who do want to do it. Mm -hmm. So good day to take, make sure we thank them. And I say Candace. Mm -hmm. um, this was, uh, you received an email on 
This was Monday too, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday. 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 All right. <laughs> so we did have a fishing attempt on Monday, or actually Sunday night, Monday. I'll let Justin speak to this one a little bit. We had a fishing attempt on Monday. <laughs> um, actually, it's, it's it started it started Sunday. Where there was a there was a, a, a fishing or spear attempt uh, uh, with our staff at at the high school. Um, unfortunately, um, even though I got an email out to not answer that, someone did, and so um, we ended up every uh, every student school district ended up getting an email trying to uh, get more information. Uh, the good news is it was uh, a very unsophisticated attempt. So even clicking on the link didn't download any any malware or viruses or anything. They were they were just attempting to see if they were willing to type in information and submit a Google form with with other information. So it's really low level. Uh, we were able to take care of uh, it, it pretty quick. Uh, within 10, 15 minutes of the emails going out to students, we 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 had the report and we were able to to jump in and take care of things. Um, within a half an hour, and then within two hours, we had logged into every K two student and deleted the the emails. Um, uh, the district office came together and logged into all those student emails and, uh, and took care of it. So, uh, big teaching opportunity for our first half once once again, as uh, digital security and nice. and whatnot is uh, is a big deal. And uh, hmm. uh, we uh, in the in the coming month or so, we will be. We will be moving to two form authentication uh, for email, um, and so that uh, that is uh, that is coming. Uh, so that that will be another training opportunity for us to, with our staff. So as we start to roll that out. Um, strategic plan. So April 10th, two weeks ago, we talked about the plan. We are modifying the schedule a little bit. We were going to have our first meeting the first week of April or May, and we're not done ready for that. So our first meeting is going to be the 15th, and then I will have a complete, uh, I'll have the completed updated schedule to you soon. Uh, but it, we're going to stretch it out a little bit more. And if you do know anybody who you would like to have on this or recommend participate on the strategic plan committee make sure you let me know we'll send them an email personally but we're going to put an invite out to the entire community the next thing is the bond and next steps we're um, getting ready to send out the survey that'll be going out the first full week of may to our community and also going to work on pulling together focus groups to bring focus our community some of our community members together and ask them questions and have some tabletop discussions and then um, work to figure out where, where, why they are, you know, making the decisions they are about the bond, whether it's a, a pro or a, um, a con and learn more about that so we can figure out what our next steps are in moving forward and when to put it on the ballot. Um, but really working to get people that, you know, don't hear from a lot to those focus groups. So if you have ideas there of people that I can reach out to and talk to, to invite to the, be a part of the focus group, please let me know. I see doing more than one of them, it is plural up there. So I think we'll do more than one and try and get a number of people in. <clears throat> Our events, so just like Grace said, um, we've got a jazz night on Saturday night, the 27th there. It's um, the middle school and the high school band will be there. I think tonight, old band is going to be there as well. It's the jazz bands of all three. It's a spaghetti dinner, $5 for a spaghetti dinner. So a great way to feed, feed a family if you want to come in and have dinner. And then I think there's a silent auction that's going to go on. And then, of course, lots of great music. So that's Saturday night. Friday night before that is the multicultural festival. And if you weren't able to attend that last year, this is the second annual and it's a wonderful night. It's the other way to come and have dinner because there will be some food representative of the different cultures in our area. And that starts at six o'clock and dinner is free for that, right, Maggie? For the first 100 people. Thanks. For the first 100 people, there you go. That's usually enough to cover. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then dual language night is on May 7th at 5.30. And that's a family night. So those families who are currently in the program will be joining together to come together and learn about what their kids are doing in class and how they can support them and uh, participate in some activities around the, the dual language program. We have a work session on May 8th 
and we are going to be talking to people who submitted their applications to use the original gym. So that's on the agenda. Um, we have both the, the historical use of the gym. They've, uh, they're coming, I think, at 6.30. And then the Boys and Girls Club will be here at 7.15 to talk to. Mm -hmm. And park graduation, or school board meeting on the 23rd of May, which is a Thursday. I keep just reminding everybody that's that unusual one because of the ESD awards session ceremony up there. And then we have a heart graduation on 6.30 on June 7th and high school graduation on the 9th. The year is rolling on. Lots of good stuff going on. Do have any questions for Jennifer? Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. um, and moving on to our next bit of business, we will start entering into our new business. Okay, we have a uh, first reading of policies. These are the policies that we, we reviewed on April 10th. If there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them or I can review them real quickly if you'd like, or we can. You spent a good time studying them on the 10th, so up to you. Mm -hmm. And these are just the first readings. We're not voting on anything tonight. Right? right. This is primarily breaking out an old policy into three policies. Correct. To separate the, the sections from nutrition, business, and wellness. Exactly. So. And it used to be all involved in one, and it's dividing it into three. Yep. And it clearly states that recess is now 30 minutes for all K5 K students. That's the big change, but we're already doing that with our kids. Next, we have our 24-25 school board meeting schedule. We looked at also huh. at our last board work session. We need to approve this. This does need to be approved, yep. It does need to be approved. All right. So do I have a motion to approve the uh, school board meeting schedule for 24-25? So moved. And do I have a second? Thank you. Any <laughs> discussion? No discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion passes. This is the part where I can make the gavel. All right. Moving on to the next, our K-5 reading curriculum, adoption and purchase. Is this something we need to? This is something we need to approve. Yep. Approval. So at the at the last board work session, we talked extensively about uh, the ninety five percent group uh, core program materials and the uh, U fly materials for the foundational ELA. Uh, and so we're looking for we're recommending the approval of those materials to purchase and move forward with. Okay. Thank you, Justin. All right. So at this time, do I have a motion to approve? So move. First, we have a second. I'll second it. Thank you. Any discussion? No discussion. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Motion passes. K uh, five teachers very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers across. Yeah, believe oh, cheers lines. across the line. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next on our new business is uh, online curriculum adoption and purchase. This is the online cur curriculum that's used for part and for our credit retrieval students at the high school. And Maggie's here to share you share with you a little bit more about this. This is we currently have Apex and it is expiring, and so we need to renew. And we're going to make some changes. So we have an opportunity here. Absolutely. So yeah, we have, you know, so we have currently uh, utilized Apex for a number of years since I've been here at least, so 10 years. Uh, so we did feel that, especially after uh, uh, remote learning, uh, a lot of different companies have upgraded and have added some different features to online curriculum. So it was time for us to 
to look at what we currently have, what are the pros and cons to that, and um, if we wanted to continue to stay with Apex or if there's a different program out there that meets our needs better. So that's essentially what, uh, what we did. Uh, just as, as a reminder, we use our online curriculum for a variety of reasons. Hart is a primary user of that because most of their curriculum, unless they have courses that are taught in person, which is very few, but they do have a few, um, it is their primary curriculum. Yeah, Hart is the way that it's designed. It is an online uh, program for most of the credits that they receive. So students will use it two ways. One, for their original credit, first time that they've ever maybe encountered a world history or a physics class or whatever. So it could be an original credit, but also as we know, the kids that come to heart may have had uh, uh, previous attempts at a credit and received and not passed them in the original at, at the high school. And so they can come in with a credit retrieval, which is a slightly modified version of the original course. At the high school, the primary purpose of using online curriculum at the high school is for credit retrieval. This is for uh, an opportunity for kids to um, get a second go at a credit uh, that they have not passed previously. There are some special circumstances where that is their original credit. It does not happen as, it, it, it is not the first go, uh, go ahead for that, but it does happen. Um, so there are some types of special circumstances where um, a student will use that for an, uh, an original credit. Okay. So, and again, APEX is what we've had for a long time. So this is kind of the process that we uh, went through to, as looking at our current curriculum and then starting to look at different new ones. So there's uh, several people that were involved in this, Justin, myself, Kevin Theonis, uh, principal at the high school, and then Kevin Wilson, principal at, okay. at heart. Uh, in October, September, October, we kind of conducted a needs assessment. We looked at what were the pros and cons, what were we hoping that any program that we offered, what were going to be the highest needs and the highest priorities for us. So I listed there the three priorities that kind of came back as the highest uh, of any program that we looked through. Uh, Built-in interventions, universal designs, and differentiated instructions. So does that online program have some built-in supports for kiddos that are struggling? Um, is it user-friendly for students? Is it engaging? Is it hard for students to kind of manipulate through the program? And then the last side is that backside management. Uh, so is, is it so great that we're going to have to hire somebody <laughs> to figure out how to run the program because it's so, it's so, it's so arduous? Uh, the other thing is some autonomy with class, class, uh, class course management. Uh, as you know, especially in HART, um, the whole point of that is to tailor um, courses and curriculum to the students' individual needs. So we wanted to make sure whatever program we went through gave the school the, the autonomy and gave the district the autonomy to tailor the course based on our standards, on what we are saying, our credit requirement types of things, not what a company wants to do. So those were our priorities. So we started looking around for different programs. Obviously, APEX was our current program. We looked at two other programs as well. And uh, we just kind of received some presentations, some information from each of those companies as far as what they currently had and what they would be able to offer our programs, knowing we were looking for both an original credit program, but it could also need the credit retrieval that we wanted as well. We um, determined, we through, through that process, we had a couple, I keep looking at Justin because he was part of this. So, um, uh, through that process, we determined that there was one program that we really wanted to pilot and test out with kids and get some kid feedback on because they are going to be the main users of this program. And so in that program was Edgenuity. Um, so Kevin Wilson did a small pilot with his students, a small group of students at heart. So he picked a, a range of students that kids that loved Apex and thought this was the greatest thing ever and kids that just were really burnt out or tired of Apex. So he really tried to make a mix of students uh, based on, on how successful they were in our current program. So he, he did that January, February, and then uh, we came back together in March and we looked at kind of what the pros and cons of, of that kind of that small pilot and then also the pros and cons of the other programs that we looked into. And based on that, we made a determination that we wanted to go with ingenuity. So the recommendation is that we will um, adopt uh, ingenuity, just to give you kind of an idea that is 
uh, they offer about 400 courses in that program, uh, core elective world history AP CTE courses. There is autonomy on how to create a course and a, uh, how to create a course and a teacher of record. That's a typo, I apologize. So when we talk about that, uh, we can hire uh, edgenuity teachers to be the teacher of record. A perfect example of this is world language. If a student's out at heart, we don't have a teacher of record in order to provide them adequate instruction in their world language. So we would then access Edgenuity's teacher of record to allow that student to provide that. That would They would be meeting virtually. That teacher would take on the grading responsibilities, take on the additional support responsibilities of that course. So there's that option. And then I always say there's like our old school option, which is we provide a teacher of record and we just use our online platform to provide the curriculum and the assessment and all those good things. Okay. I just gave you, I'm not gonna read that list, but um, I did give you a list of just some of the supports that, that are offered. Uh, it was one of the, the key priorities that we wanted to look at when looking at a different model. And so I, wanted just at least to highlight those because it was a priority of the group as we were looking. So with that, um, we are still in the process of negotiating um, what, what that, that, co that cost would look like uh, as far as uh, are we, you know, moving away from APEX and into ingenuity. So as um, we're still going back and forth about that, what you'll see there is a recommendation that we would be able to purchase an ingenuity. Um, and so the number is high because uh, again, we're, I'm, we're kind of negotiating on a one or a two year contract based on that. So that's where you'll see that approval is up to $50,000 using grant funds. So that's important to know that this isn't a basic end expense. This is a grant funded expense. But I'll answer any questions you have. Do you have a chance to talk to any other schools that are using this? So Kevin Wilson did, and so Kevin Wilson is the assistant, or assistant, the principal at heart, or the alternative, and so he really spoke to most alternative uh, high schools in the area, and then when he went to Walla, Walla. Walla, which is the alternative ed kind of state conference, he really asked around and said, what are you using, what are you using, and, and by far, this if it wasn't Apex, it was this. So that's why we felt when we made the decision about what to do a, pest, a test pilot, we already knew what Apex could do and the pros and cons of that. So that's what led us, a big factor of what led us to want to do a test pilot with, um, with Ingenuity. So if you'd use Apex again, would it have been updated or was it just the same program? It's the same program that we've, that we've had. It has updated since I, since I've been here, but the updates are pretty rudimentary, pretty um, archaic as a, as a system. It doesn't give the, um, the interface is just not as, as pretty as, it is as some of the others. And I think as a, as a learner, um, our, our learners now learn in three minute segments, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's that's how kids are. A, 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 Apex, Apex is a good 20 minutes, a half hour read and do this and do that. And they're not gonna change away from that model. Okay. Whereas what, one of the things that we see with ingenuity, one of the things that kids really enjoyed is that things are chunked for them. So they can go through a three minute piece. They can either read or watch a video or do both things. And we, we had some kiddos that really struggled with Apex. Because Apex, if you are not reading at a ninth or 10th grade level, you're really, really going to struggle with Apex. And, and this is something that we've seen over time. And one of the reasons why uh, freshmen typically have not been real successful at art is because of the the amount of reading that needs to be done. So the and and so those are some of the differentiated things we're looking for. It, because kids kids can learn using video. If someone's reading the text to you, and and I can still pick up the content and do that. But that chunking is is a really really big issue because you know every YouTube video over three minutes that was never watched, right? Except for us in the room that really have to watch it to learn something. But kids don't watch anything down three minutes. So. Um, again, this, I see this, uh, the support for students with special needs. Um, how much of this stuff is AI? Or is this, is this we have a teacher of record or record? So, like, 
Yeah. So typically, uh, when when a student enters an online course, uh, one of two things should happen: is uh, one the the online provider provides a teacher of record. So, like for example, in that world language, that is a teacher that that company has employed that is licensed and or certified in the state of Washington um, to oversee that course, to grade that course, to provide support for that course for that student in there. Uh, if that teacher of record is not provided by the company, uh, the program allows us to provide our own teacher of record. And that is where um, we have a teacher that would provide the grading, the oversight, and the support. At heart, that tends to be the teachers that are there. If a student has an IEP, uh, Kevin, is it Andrew Kernett? And Andy Kernett is the one that goes and provides the specialized instruction for students with IEPs that are at heart. So. They're still getting that one-on-one -on -one personal yeah. yes. reading the lips and having that conversation. Absolutely. So. Thank you. Awesome. Any other questions, board members? Hmm? Hey. Need uh, an action. And Maggie and I are working them over on the price. <laughs> Believe me. Kind of one time purchase, or is it every year? It's every year. We're, we're, we're working the more on the price. <laughs> That's why it says that. It is not 50000 to do one year. That is why a multi, we're, we're shooting for a multi-year contract. I see. Okay. Does it, do we get a better price? Like if we sign like a, like a 10 year lease, or do they only do them like every two or three years? Yeah. yeah. yeah we, we won't get 10 years out of it. No, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, I'll, I'll train you. I'll tell them my board chair said I need 10 years for that price. We'll I'll be coming back with a different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just want to make sure we get the best bang for our buck for our students and our parents and, and our taxpayers and our community. And, yeah. and if this is what you guys say we need to have, absolutely. But we need to walk in and get a better deal. Uh, got a better deal for our people. Yes, I, I totally agree. I think that that's why it's a vague approval because um, I, we were not ready to ask them for the official quote. I got it, Neil. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. yeah this man. <laughs> and this is grant funded, right? Yes. yes. Well, that's a plus too. Okay. All right. Any other questions, board members? All right. Well, hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the uh, online RSD curriculum for heart? So moved. And do we have a second? No, second. Do the second. <laughs> All right. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Motion passes. Ugh. All right. Next on our new business list today is off-campus overnight trip request. This is the overnight uh, trip approval for the robotics team to go to Atlanta, Georgia, um, June 29th. Awesome. Compete in national competition. <laughs> so did they raise the money yet? They are, yes, they raised a lot of money. And actually I correct myself, it's June 23rd that they go um, and they return on the 29th. But yes, they have raised their money and they left over launch here, they had some left over but they have been working hard that group of kids is tell me about it <laughs> so how many kids are going they take four four and how many adults uh two adults or oh, actually just one adult's going this year paul's going with them okay it's all boys no parents or anything it's all boys. uh we I don't think there's any parents going sometimes there is a parent that okay. travels along but not as a chaperone but not as an official chaperone wouldn't doubt that a couple may just go down for fun. Yes. But they don't want official duties. Grace, are you going? Did your team make it? No, I did not. Oh, well, you meddled, but you didn't. No, I okay. placed third. Oh, you, 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 you placed third, but you don't get to go to Nationals. Yeah. But you did place third. But there's nothing to laugh at. <laughs> oh, congratulations. I mean, it's, it's amazing what you kids have all been doing. Oh. All right. Okay, don't they, uh, do I have a motion to approve? I'm going to say yes. So I have a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 
Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes. Good luck. <laughs> you know, amazing what these kids have done with, with the loss that we had last year. This is so, so cool. All right. At this time, we are back for public comment at the end of our meeting. There's no one. We have no one online, no one in the hallway. Yep, we're all good. Oh, I miss the good old days when we used to have some people show up and have comments. <laughs> all right. And with that, I'm going to call it adjourn the meeting. <laughs>